And it's good to see you. And I hope the, um, I can stir you up tonight. I have a, a word, and I'm going to come from a slightly different angle tonight. So I'm not sure what's going to happen. But we'll see. Glory to God. Let's um, open your Bibles to, to Genesis chapter 1. I thought I'd start at the beginning. We've got plenty of time, haven't we? <laughs> Well, you can leave when you're ready. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1. I've entitled this message, or I've titled this message, From the Days of John the Baptist. And hopefully I can explain to you why. So if we start reading, let's just pray for a minute. Lord, we thank you, Father, for this, this word. Father, I pray that you'll have your way tonight, Lord. And Lord, that this message will come across, Lord, in, in the power of your might. Father, that you will open our eyes, that we may see and know the truth. Lord God, the hidden mysteries of your will will be revealed to us tonight, Lord. Help us come to know you more and come into a right relationship with you, Lord, in every way possible, Father. Pray, Lord God, that you reveal your truth, Lord God, because your word says that we will know the truth and the truth will make us free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. From the days of John the Baptist. So we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Actually, we'll go to 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, have dominion, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing on the earth that moves. And if we go move on to uh, chapter 2, verse 9, And out of the ground the Lord made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight, and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if we turn over over the page, if, if you've got a page to turn, and we go to, uh, to verse 15, the Lord had said, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden and to tend it and to keep it. So what God did is he created Adam and Eve. He created man, he put him in the garden. And he gave them dominion in, in the garden, dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing on the earth. And he gave him, uh, and he put him in, in the garden to tend the garden, to look after the garden. And what happened in, in verse 3 is the serpent came along. And the serpent deceived Adam and Eve. And if we look in chapter 3, verse 5, the serpent said to the woman in verse 4, You will not die. Actually, we'll go, we'll go to verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. This is 3 verse 1. More, then, was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden... God has said, You shall not eat, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the servant said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that in the days you eat it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So what happened here is Adam and Eve were living in a place where they had dominion over everything that God had given them. And, and the enemy came along, and he deceived them and told them that there was more. She's okay. Told them. <laughs> this is my granddaughter. The enemy told them that there was more. There was more than what God had given them. God had placed them in, a, in, in the garden and he, he told them, he'd given them dominion and he told them to tend the garden and that's what he wanted them to do. And what happened? The enemy come along and said, there's more. There's more. He, he tricked them into, into believing that what more than what God has given them. 
There is more than what God has given them. That's what the enemy said. Now Jesus, when he came to the earth, he said, I've come to do the will of the Father. He sought his Father and he sought to do the will of his Father. Nothing else. And what happened in the garden is Adam and Eve were doing what God had called them to do. And they were fulfilling everything. They had a relationship with God. They walked with Him. They talked with Him and in the garden. And they did everything that God had asked them to do. And yet the enemy came along and said, Look, if you eat of this tree, of the fruit, you will know. You will be like God. You will know good and evil. And the people desired to know more than what God gave them. To know. And so what happened then is they submitted to the enemy their authority and dominion that God had given them. They submitted that and gave that to the enemy. And then now they actually uh, uh, kneel down to the kingdom of darkness. And they allowed Satan to rule in their place where they should have been. They knew what God, Adam and Eve knew what God wanted them to do. And they did what God asked them to do. But then the enemy took them beyond that place to something that God didn't want them to do. And he brought sin into the, into the realm of righteousness. Amen? Now incidentally, Adam and Eve were already kings. Okay, Because the, the, the temptation was they would be like God and they would know good and evil. They would know more. But they were actually kings in the kingdom that God had given them. Amen? They reigned and ruled where God had placed them. There was no more to be had for them. What God had revealed to them was all they needed to know and was all they needed. And in that, they had eternal life. And they had blessings. But the enemy tricked them. And Jesus, like I said, he sought the will of his Father and to only do what his Father asked him to do. And that's why Jesus said to us, learn from me. So what we're, what's actually happening in our lives now is we have to learn how to do the will of the Father, do the, what God's Word asks us to do, and nothing else. Amen? We've got to seek the things of God, but rein ourselves back in where we are actually living in the Word of God and according to the Word of God, not living according to our own desires and our own dreams and our own passions. Amen? Because, believe it or not, when you are living... When you are plotting your own path and setting your own course, you're actually serving the devil. And he will have dominion in your life. When you are doing what you want to do, like Adam and Eve they were tempted to do what they wanted to do and know more than what God showed them, when you actually do that in your life, you are stepping away from, from God's word and you are doing something and then you're actually living in the power of darkness, under, in the kingdom of darkness. You are no longer living in the kingdom of life because you're doing what you want to do, not what God wants you to do. Does that make sense? My wife's got a worried look on her face. <laughs> as long as you seek the will of God and His ways, Jesus will reign and you will have dominion in your life. See, Jesus didn't come to reign and rule over us. Okay, The, the, the enemy wants to rule over us and over our lives, but Jesus wants to walk next to us and reign and rule in our lives through us. Amen? He doesn't want to be Lord over us. He wants to come in with us and befriend us and build us up and give us something that we can work with. Amen? Not something where, where we are always moving in the oppression of the devil. He wants to take us into a place where, where there is freedom, but there is life. Not, not what the devil tricked Adam and Eve to think there is freedom. But in that freedom of knowledge of good and evil was death. Death reigned in that place. Glory to God. God doesn't want to rule you. God wants you to reign and rule in the kingdom that he's given you. Amen. He doesn't want you to reign and rule in your own kingdom. He doesn't want you to reign and rule and, and, and do things for the enemy. He wants you to reign and rule in the kingdom of God, in the place that He has given you to reign and rule in. And He will, he will rule in you and through you in that place. Thank you, Lord. 
Jesus said, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake to find it. So what God wants us to do is he wants us to desire the things of God above the things of the world. And I'm not saying that you can't go out in the world because we've got to, we've got to work, we've got to make, make money to live. That's a requirement, otherwise we'll starve. Okay, so we've got to do things out there in the world, but we've got to bring God and have God involved in everything we do and put Him first in everything we do. Amen? To seek His will in everything that we do. And we have to be out in the world touching people's lives, otherwise they'll never know about Jesus. They'll never know the truth. Amen? Glory to God. She's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> She is cute. She's got a poppy wrapped around the little finger. <laughs> That's right. She's in Germany. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So what happened in the Old Testament is people, God would, people would go off on their own and they would have idols and their own dreams and their own visions and their own goals and they would build temples to, to false gods and they would build cities and castles all because man wanted to do what man wanted to do and then in that they would God would be throwing his word at them calling out to them with a, with a prophetic word saying follow my commandments turn Turn from your ways and come to me. God was crying out all the time in the Old Testament to people, to his people to turn back from the sin. And what happened was the enemy would come and the enemy would plunder them. And then they would, they would be captive. And then they'd be crying out to God to come and rescue them. And then God would deliver them. And then they'd be walking in God's ways. But then after a while, in the weakness of the flesh of man, they would start doing their own things again. They'd forget about what God did, forget about how God delivered them, and they would start building their own dreams and their own idols. It's almost like the enemy comes along and he throws temptation in front of them all the time. And he's telling them, you can do it your way. You don't have to do it God's way. And they start once again doing it their way, following their own dreams and their own goals, and they end up falling in a heap, and God ends up rescuing them again. Because they cry out to him. And that seemed to be the Old Testament cycle all the time. And then, But what happened was, towards the end of the Old Testament, there was about a 400 year period where everything went quiet. There was no prophets, there was no voice, there was nothing. And it was almost like God had taken a step back and thought, what am I going to do with this lot? <laughs> no? They just can't do what I've asked them to do. They can't follow my word. They can't stick to the plan that I've given them. Because there is life in the Word. But if you stray from the Word, there is death. The enemy just seemed to have a pull. So in the New Testament, God sent His Son, and His Son came, and He just broke that thing. He broke the power of the enemy over people's lives. He broke the pull in people's lives that the enemy had, that temptation, that sin. Jesus came, and He broke that thing on the cross. So no longer did the enemy have a right to keep attacking the people of God because the people, see, the, the people of God belonged to the enemy in some ways because they gave, Adam and Eve gave the authority that they have, that they had over the earth to the enemy. So all of a sudden, everyone in the world were under, under, in the kingdom of darkness, under the power of the enemy. But Jesus came along and he opened the door so that no longer could uh, there was a way for man to come out from underneath the oppression of the enemy, to, from underneath the the, uh, the pull of, of Satan, the temptation. We have we had a way that we could be set free from that. Glory to God. So if we turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter eleven. Thank you, Lord. Matthew chapter 11. Verse 11. 
Assuredly I say to you, among those born of women, there is not one risen greater than John the Baptist. But he is a, the least, he is least in the kingdom of heaven. He who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. And I just want to focus on the beginning of that scripture for a moment. And from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. Why is it from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force? All of a sudden, I, I spoke before that when Jesus was baptised and filled with the Holy Spirit, he went out into the wilderness. And then he came back from the wilderness, and the, or when he was out in the wilderness, Satan tempted him. And Jesus resisted every temptation of Satan. And then Jesus came and started preaching about the kingdom of God. And I found out in the, in the verse before that, that John the Baptist came as a voice and he, he preached, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John the Baptist mentioned about the kingdom of heaven even before Jesus mentioned the kingdom of heaven. But John the Baptist was a voice because there was a world of people... That had, that had no hope. There was no direction. There was nothing from God that was saying, turn from your ways. There was, there was no prophet. There was nothing. And John the Baptist comes along and he starts preaching, repent. He's the voice. Uh, a voice came in the wilderness saying, repent, making, preparing the way and making his path straight. John the Baptist was an anointed man and he came with an anointed message. And that message was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he started talking about this kingdom of heaven. He started giving hope to people that were lost and saying that there is a way to, to come into the kingdom of heaven. There is a way to have a relationship with God. There is a door that you can walk through. And he started by saying, repent from that. Repent from the things of the world and you will be able to come into the kingdom of heaven. So the John the Baptist came with a message. A message. And the message of repentance is, is, is like restoring a right relationship. Amen? It's, he wants God, he wants, his, the message that God was bringing was that people had to restore a right relationship with God. To turn back away from the things of the world. Turn away from your own plans and your own desires and your own passions. And, and turn into the, the word of God and the direction of God once again. Again. You know, John the Baptist they used to say, repent was a turn or burn, was what John the Baptist would say. Turn or burn. So the way, in the, the way into the kingdom of God is contrary to what to the lie that the serpent sowed in the garden. See, in the garden they were tricked into thinking that God's, uh, they were thinking that there was something beyond God's will. And they entertained that. They wanted to know beyond what God had shown. But we're challenged to reverse that. We're challenged to think only on the will of God. Amen? And, and focus on what God is saying in His Word. Not worry about all the things that the world would throw at us, but, but rein ourselves in and say, I'm going to live in this Word. I'm going to live according to the Word of God. I'm not going to live according to all the other things that the enemy throws at me. I'm not about my own decisions and my own goals. I'm about seeking the Lord in the things that I do. Amen? And bringing myself back in. Because what happens is if we come in to the, to the Word of God, that's where God's going to open your eyes. That's where He's going to take you to a realm of the Spirit that you can't see with your natural understanding. He's going to bring you into a place of relationship with Him that is a right relationship. In John 8, 29 to 30, let's turn to John 8, 29 to 36. Eight, 8, 29. I'm having trouble flicking through my Bible because Elijah hit my finger with a, th a hammer the other day. <laughs> 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 it's been, I tell you what, it's been really hard. 
<laughs> he had a sore back, so I was lifting the limestone blocks, and he was, you know, I oh, nearly cried, I tell you. I just about lost it. <laughs> and you don't realise how much you use your thumb, I tell you. Okay, John chapter 8, verse 30. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to, to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever. A son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. So in John 8, 9, Jesus is saying, Abide in me, and my words abide in you. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you are my disciple indeed. Okay, so he's, Jesus is saying that we have to come and abide in the word of God. We have to live in the boundaries that God has given us to live in. We can't go beyond what God is telling us to do because then straight away we're doing our own thing again. Amen? God wants us to come back in and live in the boundary of his word. See, with our natural mind we would think that that rules and restrictions, um, rules and laws equals restrictions. So whenever there's a rule or a law, it means that we can't do something. So that means that there must be something on the other side of that that might be good to do. It's almost like the natural, the natural mind thinks that, well, if that's the boundary, wonder what's beyond, beyond the boundary. And that's what, what the devil did again in the garden. He said to Adam and Eve, look, you know, there's something beyond what God said here. There's something more over there. You know? Come and have a look at it and serve me. <laughs> that's basically what happened. And Jesus is saying, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. Amen. He's saying, come back into my word and don't look beyond the boundaries of my word. Stay within the boundaries of my word. Glory to God. Being restrained within the boundaries of the Word of God, your eyes are going to be open. Your understanding is going to be open to things above and beyond anything you could ever see with your natural mind. God is going to build a spiritual... Your spiritual man is going to become alive. And you are going to see things as God sees them. And understand things as God understands them. Amen? Amen? Because you have come into the into the the, the 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 boundary of the word of God. Now Jesus said said uh, John eight thirty six says therefore if the Son makes you free you're free indeed. You're free if you abide in the word of God. If you don't abide in the word of God and you you say oh, I'll take this part of the word but I still want to do that. You know, you're, you're bringing yourself back into that place where you are under the oppression of the, of the enemy. You're living in the kingdom of darkness, not in the kingdom of light. Remember Jesus said that salt and fresh water can't come from the same stream. It's almost like it's always a challenge. That do you want what I've got for you? Well then you must bring yourself back into the boundaries of my word. John the Baptist was a mighty man of God, you know, and he did what God asked him to do. He came with a word, a voice in the wilderness, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And John the Baptist, I didn't realise this, um, but you know, John the Baptist had disciples. There were people that followed him. When he was in prison, he sent two of his disciples to go and see Jesus, to ask him if he was the coming one. Even though he baptised Jesus in the Jordan, and recognised that he was the Son of God, he was the Messiah, John was in prison, probably wondering, did I get it right, or, you know, whatever, and he sent his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you the coming one? So John the, the, the Baptist had disciples. Also in Matthew 3, verses 5 and 6, it says that Jerusalem, all Judea, and, and all the region around the Jordan, they went out to him. 
when he was preaching, when he was preaching that, that word of repentance, so many came. Because there was there was something going on here that that was drawing people to this word, this message that maybe there is a way that we can come into relationship with God. Maybe there is a hope for a world that's lost, that hasn't heard a voice for all these years. And John the Baptist also knew about the Spirit. He knew about the things of the Spirit. In Matthew 3.11, let's just turn to Matthew 3.11. Matthew 3.11 says, Jesus said, John the Baptist said, I indeed baptise you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Okay, so John the Baptist knew that he was preparing a way. He was preaching repentance, but there was someone that was going to come that was going to bring the power of God, that was going to bring the Holy Spirit. Amen? There was more to the message that John the Baptist had. And John knew that. He knew that Jesus was mighty than him. He knew that Jesus was coming with a message uh, and he was going to fill them with the Holy Spirit and baptise them. So John the Baptist was definitely someone that, that had a calling on his life, but he stayed within his boundaries. He did what God had asked him to do. He baptised people with a baptism of repentance. He dumped them in the water and said, Repent. Amen? But he left the next bit to Jesus. So, so John the Baptist did what he was called to do. And, and I admire the fact that he stayed within his boundaries. And he, and he understood that. Now, if we turn to John chapter 3... I just want to show you that Jesus confirms what John had said about the Holy Spirit. So if we turn to John, John chapter 3, I want to show you something here. I'm reading from the New King James. John chapter 3, 3, Jesus was talking to Nicodemus. And Jesus answered Nicodemus and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Okay, now John the Baptist, he came and told people to repent and baptise them and they could see and he was revealing to them the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him in verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered and he says, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So previously Jesus is saying, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And now he's saying, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So this is clearly, there's two things. There's seeing and there's entering in. And John the Baptist preached something that was revealing that there is a kingdom for us to, a place that we can go to. Our kingdom is at hand, he said. It's, it's there, it's within our grasp, the kingdom of God. It's not something that's miles away that you can one day hope for. The kingdom of God and the power of God is right there at hand. Okay? That's what John the Baptist was saying. And Jesus, and then he's saying, Jesus will come and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And then he's saying here, you cannot enter the kingdom unless you're born of the Spirit. Okay, so the, the importance of the Holy Spirit is 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 what what, what Jesus is um, emphasising here and what John the Baptist was the, the next part of John's message that he never preached, he let Jesus preach. So God is spirit, we know God is spirit and we know to worship God, you've got to worship Him in spirit. Uh, John 4.23 over the page says that true worshippers, uh, verse 23 John 4.23 But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Now God is seeking those who worship Him in the spirit. God is looking for people that want to have a spiritual relationship with God. That's who He is seeking. Amen? And verse 24 says God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
Now, the, the things of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit are not the things of the natural. And, and this is why abiding in the Word of God, the law will open your eyes to the things of the Spirit. But when you're not abiding in the Word of God and you're out doing your own thing, you'll only ever know as much as a natural man can, can understand. But God is saying, get out of the world and come in the boundaries of my word and I will open your eyes and you will see things and you will know things that the natural man doesn't understand, but your spirit man will be made alive and your spirit man will understand these things. Amen? And you will be able to enter in to what God has for you because you, you have built a spiritual relationship with God and your spirit is becoming made alive. He wants to reveal. He's bringing us back into the boundaries of His Word to reveal the hidden mysteries of His will. Matthew 7.13 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many go in by it. That's Matthew 7.13. Many will go in by the way of destruction. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way to life. And there are few who find it. Turn to that, John, uh, Matthew chapter 7. Let's read that again. Matthew chapter 7. I've got to bring the Bible. And I'll preach it. It's up there. Good. You're absorbing it. You're absorbing it. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. It just astounds me that, that is it the people in the world that are going to go in by the broad, the broad way? Or is it people that are seeking God that are going to miss the narrow way? It's interesting. Enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction and there are many who go in by it. Narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life and few find it. Are we the few? Is everyone who's been born again and given their life to the Lord, are we the few that find it? Or is there less than us? Are there some of us that actually are going to miss that narrow gate? Because we're still giving our lives to the Lord, but we're still focusing on the wide and the broad and still seeking our own things. And we're missing the truth. But the narrow gate and few who find it, mate, I want to be one of the few that find this narrow gate into the kingdom of heaven. And I know that I will find that narrow gate if I stay in the boundaries of this word. But if I come to know, know Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, but I don't give my life to Him, and I continue doing everything else, saying that she'll be right, she might not be right. No, we're, we are being challenged. Jesus said things as they were, and he's challenging us continuously. So I'm saying that we must, be, we must stay focused on the Word of God. You know, G, uh, Luke 9.62 says, Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plough and looking back is fit for the kingdom. It's not talking about people in the world. He's talking about people that, that Christians or people that give their lives to God and believe that they have this relationship with God, but they're not focusing on the Word of God. They're just, they're just there, but not really there. There's a challenge to us every day in our lives that we have to get in the boundaries of this Word and live in the boundaries and block our minds to the things of the world. Because the enemy, he will just use that to, you know, if you... If you he will use that to, to tempt you, to, to open your eyes to something that you don't want to see and make something look good in the world that's actually going to draw you away from the things of God. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to drag you away from the things of God. But Jesus is saying, saying you know, when you put your hand to a plough, I mean, my father-in-law's got a really old plough and every, every time we've got to lay a pipe in the paddock or something, we tie it behind the ute. And, and, and you drive the ute and you've got to push this thing and you've got to hold it straight and you've got to look where you're going otherwise you just wander all over the place and you've got to focus on what you're doing. If you start ploughing, if the person's ploughing the field and they're looking 
away, that plough is going to be wandering all over the place. You're not going to be doing, uh, gaining what you, what you set out. The goals aren't going to be fulfilled that you set out to do. You won't be in a straight line. But he's saying narrow is the way. We've got to stay focused, people. We've got to stay focused on this Word of God and we've got to study this Word and we've got to see God. Amen? We've got to keep ourselves in the boundaries of the Word. Hallelujah. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Oh, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience, to the obedience of Christ. Isn't that what, what Satan did in the garden? He, he exalted himself against the knowledge of God. He did what he told Adam and Eve to do, what they, what they want to do, and not do what God wants them to do. He told them to disobey the word of God. I mean, the devil said... You won't die. What a lie. They did die. But they they were exalting themselves above what God had told them to do. And this and I look at this scripture and I think, you know, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, every time I'm doing what I want to do, apart from the word of God, I'm exalting myself against what God has asked me to do. He wants me to stay within the word. Not, not go and, and find out for myself what I think is right. He's saying stay in the boundaries of the word and don't, don't question his word. Don't say, no, I'm not going to do that because this is better. Do what God's asked you to do and stay in that place. And bring every thought into captivity. Everything that the enemy throws at you, every temptation, say, no, that's not right. Judge it there and then and say, that's not right. This is against the will of God. This is against what God wants me to know. He wants me to know the good things. He wants me to know about Him, about His Spirit, about His Word, about the life that He has for me. He wants me to know about healing. And, and, and He wants me to move in the power that He has. He doesn't want me to be focused on everything that the world is bombarding in our faces all the time. He wants us to draw a line somewhere and get these thoughts that the enemy throws in your mind and bring them into captivity and bind that thing there on the spot and say, no, I'm not going to entertain that thought. I'm not going to entertain the thought of maybe doing that because I'll get something out of it. God's saying, stay in this, stay in his word. Amen? Stay in his word. Don't let the enemy's words of temptation Drag you out of, of what God's got for you. God knew that if Adam stepped out of the boundaries he placed, he had placed, they would die. Because he said, if you eat from the tree, you will surely die. God knew that. That's why God's got his word here for us, saying if you stay in this word, you won't die. You will live. But if we step out of the boundaries of his word, we'll die. And the serpent said they wouldn't die. Ephesians 6.12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You know, there, there, there are things going on in the spiritual realm that affect our lives every day, that attack us, that, that bring pressure on us all the time, continuously. And they're real today. It says of this age. It's not something that happened once years ago. It's something that's alive now. But unless God opens our eyes, unless we learn the things of the Spirit, we're not going to be spiritually aware. And we're not going to understand what's happening in our lives. So there are people in the world that are suffering all sorts of things, 
they may need deliverance. They may, they may have a demon, they may have some spiritual oppression in their life and you can take as many drugs from doctors and tablets and operations and it'll never get rid of the spirit thing that's, that's oppressing you. But God has shown us that we have authority over the demonic and we can cast out these things and set people free. Amen? Amen. But that, to the natural man, is foolishness. Isn't it? But, but to us, who focus on the things of God, it's not foolishness. You know, that's, that's the real life. The spiritual realm contains the natural. And as much as you will ever learn and know in the natural, the spiritual is so much bigger. And there's so much more. Amen? And that's what God wants to do. He wants to open our eyes to the things of the Spirit. We turn to 2 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to close it a sec. One Corinthians chapter two, verse verse nine. Paul is saying, "I is not, it is, but it is written, I is not seen, nor is ear heard, nor is entered into the heart of man the things which God has for those who love Him." And then he says, "But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit." For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the Spirit of man? And who knows the things of God except the Spirit of God? And we have received. So, so what he's saying in verse 14, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit, though foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So if you want to know about the things of the Spirit, we need to have a relationship with the Spirit of God. Amen? We need to be made alive. We need to be stirred up so our spirit man is, built, is, is desiring the things of the Spirit of God. Amen? We need to, we need to come into a place and, and where we are feeding our spirit. Amen? Not feeding our natural man with natural things, but we're feeding our spiritual man. And our spiritual man will grow and grow. And then the things of the world will become irrelevant because God's opening our eyes to the things of the Spirit. He's opening our eyes to, to the bigger picture. Amen? To things that we haven't seen before. You know, Paul said we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. You know, we're in a battle. And we wrestle again, not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. You know, every time you decide to, to say, right, I am I'm going to focus on the Word of God. I am going to not let the things of the world rob me from spending time with God. You guarantee that everything will come at you to stop you from spending that time with the Lord. Because the enemy will do anything he can to stop you from having a relationship with God. It's a con constant battle. And we've got to rise up, we've got to learn to stand and say, no, I am not going to bow down to this. I'm not going to let this rob me of building a relationship with my God. Because God has something here that He wants to show us. <coughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Remember Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. I used to go, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord, all the time. And then one day he said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And that really knocked me for a while. And I realised that God was serious about his word. And he means what he says. And you know, I, don't want, I don't want you to confuse the kingdom of God and salvation. Because there's two messages here as well in salvation. But... You know, the kingdom of God is a life that God has for us now. He wants us to live this life now. And, and we have to focus on doing what He wants us to do so we can move in the power of His Word. So we can see the miracles and the signs and wonders. So we can enter into that life that He has for us. You know, if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you belong to Him. And he will never let you go. He'll hang on to you and he will, he will work with you continuously to bring you into this place. Amen. He'll never let you go. But this is a life that we want now. 
it starts today. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's today. It's for now. It's not for when I die. I'll go to heaven. So I'll just, you know, thank God that I'm saved and live, do what I want to do now because I'm going to go to heaven when I die. This is a this is a life that God's got for us. This is this is living in the power of God. This is this is us moving in in the in the gifts of the Spirit so that we can be a witness. Like Paul said, I come in demonstration of spirit and of power. We want to be effective as Christians. We don't want to be living a life where the world says, well, I don't want to be a Christian, you, you know. We've got all the same things out there. We've got, uh, what are they called? You know, card readers, you know. Tarot card readers. Tarot card readers and, and, you know, crystal balls. And we've got everything. We've got all these people with all these worldly answers, you know, and some of them are in the realm of the Spirit, but not the Spirit of God. They're in a different realm. And they're finding answers and, and they're all lies from the, from the devil. You know, but we have the power of God. We have the truth. This word endures forever and ever and ever. This will never die. This word will endure eternally. And if we abide in this word, we will endure eternally. Amen? We will live that eternal life if we live in the word. And we will have something that that the world will say, man, I want what that person's got. I want that life that that person has. Amen? Mm. So I guess I call this message from the days of John the Baptist because that's what he started to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And, and I saw in this word, I saw how there is such a, 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 there's a boundary and there's such a temptation out there to drag us out of the boundary of the word of God. You know, God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But he placed them in the garden. And it's almost as though, and he also said, subdue the earth. Right? And it's like he placed them in the garden. And I believe as they multiplied and become fruitful, the boundaries of the garden would, would grow. And eventually the whole earth would be filled and covered by, by these people that love God. By people that, that seek to do the will of God by people that don't want to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. People that aren't tempted to, to be sucked into what the world's throwing at. Amen. And that's what that's what we are. We are a people that, that are learning how to how to trust in our God. So you know it's not easy when there's something that might look good or taste good or feel good in the world. It's not easy to say no, I don't want that because God doesn't want me to have that. That, that's not easy to do. But that's faith. And you can go all the way to the grave and die having never had an answer to a prayer or having never ever uh, fulfilled an earthly desire. But that's faith. That's standing on the Word of God. That's believing and trusting in God's Word, isn't it? To the end. Amen? He wants us to hang on to Him all the way to the end and not think that Oh, I missed out on that in life because I was a Christian. Because that's what Satan wants you to believe. And some people, it plays on their minds, and in the end, after years and years of going to church, they chuck it all in and go and live in the world. It's like they kept on meditating on those things, and they got sucked into it. And so we've got to draw a line and say, no, I'm not going to let the enemy take me away from what God's Word says. Amen? So the, the questions I can throw at you before we close is which kingdom do you abide in? And what changes may you need to make to enter into the kingdom that's at hand? And do you cast off restraint? And do you waver or do you stand? Think about it. It's God's way or no way. There's no other way. It's only God's way. That's the way that leads to life. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you for this word. Father, I pray that, that you will bring it to our minds and our hearts, Lord God, during the week, that you will speak to us, Lord God, in every way. Father, help us to make right decisions. Help us to make right choices. And help us not to be led astray 
by a lying enemy that wants to destroy our lives. Help us stay within the boundary of your word that your life may be abound in us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Is there anyone here that would like prayer tonight? Is there anyone here that doesn't know the Lord? Is there anyone here that wants to be filled with the Spirit? Or wants a, a touch from God? Please come forward and pray. Otherwise, thank you for your attention.